Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to greet everyone from Warsaw, Poland, uh, where we came up with this uh, project to, to look into Chinese disinformation in various regions of the NATO. Uh, as you probably all know, we are no, now experiencing quite a lot of uh, pressure here in Europe in terms of certain build-up, certain tension, but we still are very happy to go back to our webinars, to our expertise so we want to share with you today. We already had a webinar on Central Europe and Baltic states. To get, to get, today, we're going to speak about uh, Western Balkans and uh, Black Sea region. We realized that very much and very often it has been not that much in focus when we were speaking about Chinese disinformation. This was the reason why we gathered today a fantastic constellation of uh, experts. And uh, I'm Veronica Laputska uh, from GMF, and I'm really, really excited now to pass on uh, the floor to our, to Alexander Martin, to our uh, moderator. But before that, I would just like to share with you also that uh, this is the second webinar, and this is going to be the third webinar focused on Western Europe. So please stay tuned. And afterwards, we will uh, publish a big paper. Uh, where we will be looking on Chinese disinformation and how it's uh, operating in Central Europe, in Baltic states, in Black Sea region, and also in Western Europe. So please stay tuned, and uh, I do wish you a great time and enjoy today. And we all hope that you're going to be active. Feel free to share your ideas, questions, anything. Alexandra, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. Good afternoon uh, or good morning, depending where, depending where you are tuning in from. And welcome to, to this webinar on Chinese influence and misinformation in, in the broader Black Sea region and the Western Balkans. Um, as Veronica mentioned, all eyes are on Ukraine, actually, and the exchange between Russia and the West. The West, yet uh, other threats continue to loom uh, around and impact our societies and our democratic structures. Um, and that's the reason why uh, the, the series of webinars on Chinese uh, influence continue. I am in great company today uh, to discuss these topics, and I would like to express a, a kind welcome to Laura Thornton, Senior Fellow and Director, Alliance for Securing Democracy, the German Marshall Plan, coming, uh, tuning in, not coming, uh, virtually coming all the way from Washington, D.C., uh, to Sorin Yonitsa, President of Expert Forum, uh, tuning in from Bucharest, I assume, Romania, and Stefan Vladislaliev. Uh, program coordinated of the Belgrade Security Forum, I assume tuning in from Belgrade. Uh, my name is Alexander Martin. I am a Riffing C Fellow with the German Marshall Fund and also an Associate Fellow with Globsec. Um, just before we kick it off, uh, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, we will be running for about an hour and a half. This is all on record. Um, please, please use the Q&A um, in a chat box, so use a chat for uh, sending your questions and try to be as specific as possible in terms of the speaker that you're addressing it to. Um, do not uh, wait until we start the q and I will be picking up uh, your, your uh, views and your inputs as, as we run uh, along. And without further ado, I want to kick it off and I would like to invite Laura um, to give us a bit of a broad view on what's going on uh, in, in the broader Black Sea region, but also in the Balkans, um, given that your, your uh, Herald the, the Hamilton uh, tracking uh, tool. Uh, Laura, to you. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be with such esteemed panelists. And thanks to GMF Warsaw for putting this together. Uh, exactly. I'm going to try to do a uh, bird's eye view because um, there are people that can speak more um, succinctly to the individual countries and contexts. However, I'm having trouble going to view from the beginning of the slide. So let's see how this goes um, because I can't get this out of the way. Okay, hold on. All right, well, I'll have to do it like this because the Zoom thing is blocking my ability to, to go from first slide. So anyway, I hope you can see that relatively well. Um, you know, I. We at ASD, we are tracking autocratic efforts to undermine democracy uh, and obviously uh, come up with some policy strategies to defend against these efforts. And a big component of this is looking at the information environment. So this is really, again, just sort of bird's eye view. Uh, from, from the Black Sea and Western Balkans, 
China, you know, until really recently, hasn't we haven't seen a lot of activity. Um, mostly it was focused on BRI and different Chinese investments in that regard. Um, but when the COVID crisis hit, we did see sort of Chinese diplomats and state media pushing narratives uh, around the origins of the virus, around their helpfulness uh, to the region. And nevertheless, I would say overall, with the notable exception of Serbia, which I think we'll get into, uh, Chinese disinformation attempts in the Black Sea region and Western Balkans are obviously continue to be dwarfed by uh, Russian efforts, uh, whom we also track in the area. But just some some data from Hamilton. So Hamilton 2.0 is our dashboard where we look at uh, state actors or state backed actors. Um, and what's fascinating uh, when we were pulling up this data, which covers January 2021 until January 2022. So it's inclusive of this month. And you think about what's happening this month and Serbia is dwarfing uh, coverage of Ukraine in the Twitter handles of diplomats. Now, with regard to Chinese state media, however, we do see Ukraine taking the top spot, but Serbia is a close second, uh, which is interesting. In terms of the narratives and sort of the greatest hits, we see you know, praise of the Serbian president as, as number one, then you know, again, vaccine and COVID related messaging and a spread of disinformation related to US biomilitary research, which I can get into in a bit. You know, for the Western Balkans, uh, there are none of the major, major Chinese news agencies or television networks like CGTN have uh, um, local language edition, which is really in contrast, for example, to China's efforts in sub-Saharan Africa, where they have literally the largest network of reporters out of all the media present on the content, continent. So that, that's very different. Um, so most of the success of Chinese disinformation is through the amplification by local media. Another thing that we can get into later in terms of tactics is, is uh, China focuses mostly on perceptions of China. And, and you compare that to Russia, where Russians can get involved in basically any issue under the sun. The Chinese are really focused on promoting China. Um, as you can see from this chart, which is from the European Parliament's Facebook data analysis, they also found that if they're looking at sort of likes and shares and, and whatnot and comments related to China and the Western Balkans, it's, it's half is disinformation, according to their analysis. Um, I think we'll get more into Serbia later, but obviously uh, Serbia is the outlier here with regard to getting this disproportionate attention. Um, it's so successful in Serbia that we've seen it permeate to other um, Serbian speaking populations. China Radio International has such a significant uh, digital presence, and that is in the Serbian language, and it's broadcast by Welcome to Fun Radio. Um, China Daily and CRI often have articles featured in Serbian newspapers. CGTN is on the menu for uh, cable networks. And, you know, Serbia's public broadcaster, RTS, does highlight Chinese cultural um, successes. And a lot of the main narratives, and we can go into this later, but, you know, emotional connection with NATO uh, bombing and the anniversary around that, and then mask and vaccine um, diplomacy with the president kissing the flag or laying the first stone at the Sinopharm uh, factory, et cetera. You know, one of the things that we're really interested to do at ASD is, you know, we talk a lot about <laughs> disinformation, malinformation, misinformation, and not have a really good sense of, is it working? What's the impact? Who's believing it, who's not? Public opinion polls are imperfect because we can't prove causality here, but it is interesting if you look at IRI's polling in Serbia that um, whether the question is, who do we have the best relationship with or positive influence of which countries or who do we want closer ties with? Russia and China are top of the list while the EU, US and NATO have negative influence. Now, shifting over to the Black Sea and our research looking at Romania, Bulgaria, Ukraine, and Georgia, um, uh, most of it is related to, again, sort of investments, Belt and Road, et cetera. Um, I can talk a little bit about Georgia. I lived there for seven years, so it's very close to my heart. And when I was there, I was working on um, democracy programming, building citizen resilience and resistance to disinformation and tracking public opinion. And what I find interesting about China's uh, efforts in Georgia in particular is um, their amplification of the sort of greatest hits of Russian disinfo. 
So in a way, like the work had been done for them and they've just piggybacked on a lot of those, uh, a lot of that messaging. China also has a low profile multimedia page called For, uh, For You GE Georgia, which is owned by GBT Times, but nothing else really in that regard. The, a big area of focus in Black Sea and in particularly in Georgia is disinfo surrounding US biomilitary labs. Um, you know, I Luger Lab in Tbilisi has been just something that has been a source of narratives from the Kremlin for years. I've been tracking it <laughs> um, and measuring public opinion about it. And now the Chinese actually recently put out a documentary about the Luger Lab. They, of course, also included um, you know, information that disinformation about how COVID was created at Fort Detrick, a lab in Maryland. But anyway, what's fascinating about the documentary, the Chinese documentary, was then the Russians in turn amplified the Chinese documentary. So that symbiotic relationship. Um, I think I need to wrap up here, but just in terms of the public opinion that we did in Georgia, and we've done it um, elsewhere uh, when I was at NDI, the good news is, is, you know, a lot of these myths around Luger don't seem to stick. Uh, like you can see here from the COVID, does the Luger lab spread coronavirus? Only 4% say that's the case. Uh, we have other public opinion data, which I can, I can share about common disinformation threads. Now, just before I close really quickly, because I, I feel like we spend a lot of time diagnosing problems and not talking about solutions, uh, I'm guilty too. Uh, I think, you know, in terms of looking at some successes, some of the things that I used to do in my previous work in um, the Black Sea region was working with NATO missions on creating national narratives and public diplomacy strategies. This also included, for example, uh, testing preemptive messaging um, and sort of seeing what, you know, sort of sticks with the public and then working on developing the right messengers to get out ahead of if disinformation on the sort of the most popular themes. Uh, we had some success in this regard. Another important point here, of course, is the, the separation of media and state. And it's important for uh, pressure to be put on governments that are attempting to weaken press freedom, of course. But I would say my favorite and I think the most effective work, which is also the hardest, is going local and really investing in democratic efforts at the local level. I mean, the national level, of course, is very important, but we found building citizen resilience through strong community institutions. I mean, we're talking about like rec centers and Girl Scouts and public libraries that these had a positive effect in, in some of our research in terms of bolstering citizen resistant to disinfo narratives, investing in local government, particularly efforts to ensure that they're open and transparent because corruption is the biggest erosion of public trust in democracy, which then leads to the rabbit hole of other actors. Um, and, and finally, I would just really push for investment in research. And, and this is not self-interested, I swear. But um, you know, we need to do better at figuring out who's vulnerable, you know, what populations, what demographics, what geographic areas, what is the best way to reach, what narratives are sticking, testing counter messages. I think we can do, we can do more in this regard. And so I think I've overdone my time. So I'll stop here and apologies that I couldn't do the screen share properly. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Laura. We'll for sure get back because I'm super interested on, on your ideas on how to go local because there is so much local and so many languages and so many characteristics. And at times it feels like a, a bit of a mission impossible and who's responsible at the end of the day. So I will get back to you on that one. Uh, but I, I want to, to hear uh, Serene's views uh, on more maybe a country approach in the Black Sea region, Romania, Bulgaria, Moldova maybe. Um, what is your, your uh, experience so far when it comes to, to tracking the, the, the Chinese disinformation narratives, um, whether or not they stick. Um, and maybe if you can touch a bit on the 16 plus one format and uh, whether or not the, the, um, the Chinese uh, presence, if we can put it that way, is built around that or on other, uh, other issues of interest for them would be great. So Rin, over to you. 
Thank you. So for us, this is a relatively new uh, new thing to monitor China China's influence in the in the, in, in Romania in new member countries of the European Union, Black Sea area, because we are used to looking at Kremlin, and there are some similarities, but also big differences. And uh, uh, I want to give you a very um, uh, recent view. We are preparing now a report on what is going on with China's influence in Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, so um, we have to be, to be very clear. So there are good news and bad news here. I will leave the bad news for the, for the last because this is what I think is relevant in terms of China's influence. But if I'm to summarize the last two years, it's been a period of setback for China, especially in the region. They, were, they haven't been very involved to start with. Uh, but the setbacks are obvious. You mentioned the 17 plus one, actually today the 16 plus one, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, there's consensus among political elites in Sofia, in Bucharest, that it's been mostly hot air. There is dissatisfaction that uh, they, they promote, uh, you know, trade relations very much. Uh, you can see much in the, you know, in the trade statistics that uh, that we we have achieved something. The Bulgarians were especially uh, pissed off that they couldn't promote, uh, you know, trade with agricultural goods, um, and that was clear in the last in the last uh, summit. Uh, the Huawei uh, affair. I, I mean, Huawei in a way uh, it was an exception, a big. Uh, uh, company with interest in a technologically advanced domain, and they had a real interest in all the countries. But then, to cut the story short, you know that the strategic decision was, was taken very visibly in Romania, but in Bulgaria as well, in, in many other countries, to uh, to cut short, uh, you know, their uh, their penetration, especially in the three G, uh, in the five G uh, technologies. So. Uh, they started to have partnership with universities, with technological research centers, but it, it didn't get very far. They are still present, but uh, much less influence. And then you have the big uh, B, BRI type projects. So the big ones, the big, uh, the mega fauna, right? A big infrastructure, energy, well, mostly hot air as well. So nothing, nothing came out of it uh, at all in Romania, but I would say also in Bulgaria, there was talk. They are still in reports I've seen in cross-country monitorization. You still speak about uh, Varna Harbor or uh, energy in Romania, but they are blocked actually, and nothing comes out of it. At least if you look at the project, the proposals in Romania, they were all, you know, unworkable under the EU regulations. They were just attempts to uh, to get state aid in a way or another, whether the nuclear plant or the hydropower plants. It, they were not economic to start with under the EU rules. So, um, but people uh, spoke about these things a lot. And then uh, uh, you don't have much, uh, you know, uh, like in Western Europe, in Romania, in Bulgaria, in Moldova, in the Balkans in general, there's no... Uh, you know, companies with advanced technologies that the Chinese might be interested to buy, uh, because whatever existed, it was taken by the Western partners in the pre-accession period. Um, and uh, there's even this, uh, you know, uh, retrenchment of, of China a bit with their res more recent austerity or the revision of strategy. They don't splash money around so much. It's obvious in the last year, they became more realistic. Uh, then you have the Confucius Institutes. Yes, they exist. They have partnerships in universities. But I had to quote a very interesting remark by one of the professors uh, in Bucharest. Uh, there's not enough proficiency in Chinese language in order for them to become permeable to propaganda. So, uh, and this, uh, you know, you understand this if you look at the declining standards in Romania higher education. They didn't expect you know, the students to be very fluent in order to become proper Chinese propagandists. So it doesn't really work. So it's pretty marginal in countries like Romania and Bulgaria. Uh, and there's one more obstacle, especially in Bulgaria today, because you have a, a party with significant presence in the Bulgarian parliament and the European parliament of the Turkish minority. 
and they are very outspoken on the on the Uyghur issue. Uh, and one of their MPs is part of this Butikofer group who was banned in China. So, uh, you know, there's a ferment in Bulgaria who keeps up on the agenda this uh, human rights issue for good or they are part of ALDE, so the European Liberal Group. So it's difficult to push this narrative uh, in, in the region. What is interesting, on the other hand, is what's going on below the radar. Local, a partnership with local and regional authorities. Yes, it worked, especially like last year on the, in this uh, COVID diplomacy push. And there are a lot of instances where they, uh, you know, they managed to put up this propaganda show, especially with mayors, with uh, regional bosses. And uh, uh, what is more, in Bulgaria, they push very much tourists. So a lot of mayors of uh, Varna, Burgas, Plovdiv, they are very happy. They put up this event with the China's embassy to promote tourists, so to bring in Chinese tourists. And uh, uh, it seems to be successful to, to some extent. Uh, uh, in some cities, the number of Chinese tourists uh, is bigger than the number of German tourists, for example. And this is a new development. Uh, then the, uh, another vulnerability are the party links, which again, most of the time are below the radar and especially the how they hook in the youth organizations of the party. And we will try to expand this in, in our report, but we have examples of, uh, of politicians and not the old generation, not the old communists who were part, uh, who were members of the party, but especially in younger generation who, you know, are permeable to these links and to, the emoluments that come with uh, with uh, with these uh, activities, and then you have a whole ecosystem of small and mid-sized companies, and this is really very diverse. And this is where the Chinese presence really exists in countries like Romania and Bulgaria. Sometimes they are on competitive uh, sectors, so there's nothing wrong on that, especially when they piggyback on Western investment. For example, when they bought the Pirelli Group, the tire uh, makers. Uh, this Pirelli group had operations in Romania. So of course the Chinese became owners of the operations in Romania. They continue to operate, they sell tires. I mean, I don't see much risk here. They also bought a big uh, pig farm or something. But uh, there are many, you know, a friendship, uh, the chambers of commerce, uh, China, Romania, friendship house, where you see the political links, uh, especially with, uh, with, uh, with the shady part of the Romanian business. And this is a story to follow because apparently they function, you know, as a uh, as an enabler. I mean, their natural counterparts are, uh, you know, the uh, the the people who uh, who have uh, dubious businesses in Romania. Uh, small oligarchs, because we don't have big oligarchs. Some are with a presence in the media, in the real estate sector. And, you know, it's like a natural attraction. There are companies, all the examples that we collected of investments are failures. Uh, they ended up being investigated by prosecutors for fraud. Uh, there was a big, uh, you know, solar park, uh, a company in China uh, who, you know, for some years they kept the headlines, but they, they ended up being delisted in China. So they were dubious even by Beijing standards. Um, so the story to tell here is how these people, you know, uh, uh, find each other uh, and how they, uh, uh, they, they find potential in this dubious part of the Romanian business sector. Um, and there are many, many examples like this in the, as I said, in the real estate, in the uh, small energy sector, um, how they instrumentalize, uh, uh, again, the old partnership with the state media sector, because coming from the old times, there were partnerships between, between the Romanian state media, the, the news agency and the Chinese ones. Uh, of course, this is not something, this is not an operation targeting the big public. It's in Romanian language, it's a bit like Sputnik. It's not for the bigger public. They don't aim for a big audience, but they want to target the opinion leaders, maybe the party leaders and function, you know, like, uh, uh, um, and even to recognize people who come close to their language, you know, they try to, uh, to attract people with big egos who are rejected by parties, politicians who spend time in jail, you know, so uh, they, they try to fish in, in, in these waters. Um, 
They also try to instrumentalize the Chinese diaspora, which is not big in Romania and Bulgaria, but it exists. And with some success in Bulgaria, uh, there are, you know, local business uh, leaders of Chinese origin from the diaspora who go on TV, they go on media, and they promote the Beijing discourse. So they are completely in line with the Communist Party discourse. Where I see the risk, and I will, I will stop here, because this is, I think, the big story. It's on the medium and long term. Um, it's a propaganda by invitation that function in countries like Romania, Bulgaria, uh, or Moldova. It's a weakness in our own society, which invites actually this propaganda. And it's based on, on, on several, uh, on several um, elements. One is this narrative of stellar success of Beijing, China being, uh, having developed in the last decades and uh, going from uh, you know, success in success. Uh, a, a very unscientific survey we carried out among Romanian students free association of words, when you mention China, a Romanian student would come, oh, economy, development, uh, industrialization, everything, you know, from uh, 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 all the targets are met, which of course is a sort of mythology. Uh, and the second is their sheer presence here as an alternative model at a moment when the Europe or the West, you know, uh, suffers a bit of decredibilization for many reasons, the crisis, the COVID, withdrawal from Afghanistan, now we have the energy crisis in Europe, um, the Kremlin is exploiting these, uh, this, uh, you know, difficulties, but China doesn't have to, they just have to be there and benefit from this mythology, they are very distant. Um, no Romanian or Bulgarian knows uh, what is going on there. It's like, you know, a myth. And when there's a myth, you actually project on it uh, expectations, hopes, ideology. And this is happening, actually. This is happening and this is dangerous, especially for the young people, because in this way, it plays much more effectively than Kremlin uh, against the uh, European project. Um, Sorry. Uh, Russia, Russia can be aggressive, but it is not credible as an economic alternative model because everyone sees it's a failure, but China is. And my feeling is that populists um, or, um, uh, you know, um, um, uh, opportunistic cronies uh, in our countries uh, or even true believers in illiberal uh, values uh, uh, now raise their head in our societies and find an encouragement in the presence of China, the silent presence of China as a successful alternative model. In the long run, I think this is a danger and I will show you uh, uh, very briefly an illustration here, uh, which is something then that which was on our TV last year, one of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, TV contests about talent, music, it was on Pro TV, which is a, a, a TV with very big audience. This is a girl, a Romanian girl, 10 year old, uh, uh, in a Mao Red Guards uniform who won the contest. Everybody was in trial. Uh, it happened last year. Uh, she's a Romanian with her parents move over to China some years ago. I don't know what they do there, but they participated in the contest in Romania. The fact is irrelevant. What is relevant is the response of the Romanian audience to such a big uh, to, to such a, a big audience show uh, on 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 primetime TV. Nobody had any idea what the uniform represented. Nobody made any connection with the Chinese history, with the uh, cultural revolution, with the horrors of the Mao era. Everyone was absolutely in trial. They were, uh, this is some Chinese opera. These were actually revolutionary sounds. So it shows you the ignorance and the terrain, which is very permeable. Uh, to this, you know, uh, uh, attractive model of Chinese success. And I will uh, stop you here, Sorin, uh, because we're way, here. you're Thank way you. over your time, but I will get back to you on the solutions actually to fix this, because you, you said that the, the risk yeah. is on, on long term. And how do we fix the, the ignorance, let's put it that way, or how do we solidify the ground for, for such uh, narratives not to be uh, taking off? Um, I want to move to you, Stefan, to give us a bit of a view from the Western Balkans, because what we saw from um, Laura, uh, from Hamilton, but also from Sorin, is that 
it's still in an incipient phase in the Black Sea region, um, but there are there is a, a big difference in in the Western Balkans, in particular in Serbia, but actually from from my own research also in in places like uh, Bosnia and and so on and so forth. So over to you, please stick to your time, uh, so we can get back to to the interactive part of of the the webinar. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Alexandra, and I will try just to provide the outline that can uh, be used for the further discussion in the Q&A section as well. So yes, you're completely right, and uh, the data that has been shown in the first part of the discussion can also show that there is no template, actually, and that has to be understood. There is no template to explain the Chinese presence in the Western Balkans region, and there are outliners. On the one side, we have Serbia as an uh, uh, example of uh, successful Chinese uh, uh, influence, input, and uh, well, uh, well reception by the Serbian uh, political leaders. But on the other side, we have country like Kosovo, which uh, doesn't even have uh, any established diplomatic relations with China due to the fact that uh, Kosovo has not been recognized as independent country uh, by the by, by the Be Beijing. Um, what was the entrance point? Uh, yes, uh, Belt Road Initiative. Uh, that has been launched in 2013 was, is actually the entrance point right now, but um, even before that, we can actually pinpoint the beginning of contemporary relations between China and, let's say, Serbia as the outliner that dates back to the 2009, and the first infrastructural projects are actually dating back even prior to the launch of the 17 plus one, 16 plus one initiative and or uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative as well. And those infrastructural projects like the one in Bosnia and Herzegovina, like the one in um, Montenegro, have become the staple of the Chinese presence in the region uh, being promoted as a, a major opportunity for the not only uh, infrastructural, but the overall economic development development uh, in the region. And that brings me uh, to the two main dominant narratives that I would like to highlight. Uh, for a long period of time, economic development narrative, which has been pushed by the Beijing and uh, accepted in some capacities uh, by the countries from the uh, from the Western Balkans, was the main uh, dominant narrative. Basically, if you cooperate with China, they will give you opportunity to uh, have a pretty cheap um, infrastructure when it comes to the interest rates, uh, infrastructure loan agreements. Although those agreements will be preferential, meaning that you will have to uh, employ Chinese company to uh, construct those highways or uh, um, coal power power plants like it was in Serbia or in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, it was represented as a chance for your uh, foreign trade, uh, for the export as well, a large market that has been seen uh, by the first and foremost uh, domestic companies as a major chance, but also uh, also Serbian politicians. And when it comes to the Serbian case, and uh, before mentioned the uh, President Aleksandar Vucic, uh, actually that is where the ideology of the Beijing and the ideology of Serbia right now aligns, and that is the promotion of economic development and basically put, uh, positioning economic development as the ultimate value when it comes to the uh, policy and decision-making process, both within, Serb both within Serbia, but also on the international, international scene as well. And that has made China important, but not as seen partner for, for, for Serbia and for, for the Serbian citizens. What really boosted the Chinese image for the Serbian citizens and created those kind of the op opinion pools that we have seen in the first part was the, co the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, at the beginning, ma mask diplomacy then followed one year later, almost one year later by the vaccine diplomacy here really positioned China as one of two most popular partners of Republic of, of, Republic of Serbia and one of two most um, popular foreign actors uh, in the eyes of the Serbian, uh, Serbian citizens. But uh, while we can discuss whether that uh, can be called the Chinese direct propaganda, and I will uh, give you argument why I, I, I tend to, um, to explain it a little bit different, it is uh, certainly a position which, which is uh, beneficial for China. Uh, Serbia has become the European country, and kudos for GMF to including the Western Balkans in the discussion about the Chinese influence in the Europe. Some other, um, for example, EU tends to forget this for, from time to time. Um, it is it is important to understand that Serbia is not only the good PR opportunities uh, for for China. Serbia is also a candidate country for the EU membership in the future. And if we see some uh, of the examples that uh, some of the po uh, policies have already been impacted by the Beijing. We can imagine what is potential uh, pot potential for uh, the uh, in policy influence uh, in if and when Serbia becomes part of the um, European Union. 
uh, to uh, get back on the COVID-19 for a second. Uh, it is not only that we have seen the positive uh, representation of China and Chinese help, including the flags kissing, we have also for the first time openly seen uh, the uh, two conflicted sides, uh, basically putting EU on one hand and uh, Beijing on the other side, uh, directly confronting those two actors by the Serbian decision makers, Serbian uh, politicians, uh, with the statements like uh, that European solidarity is dead and that the only country that can help us is, uh, is China, presenting Xi Jinping as Serbian, uh, the brother of the Serbian citizens and, and, and friend of the, of the Serbian, Serbian citizens um, as well. Uh, those processes have been heavily facilitated by, by the Serbian media. And uh, if we speak about the direct, and, and this is the part where, where I want to address the, uh, if, whether we are speaking about the direct Chinese uh, propaganda. Yes, uh, there is a direct Chinese propaganda in Serbia, but it, it has limited capacity. Uh, when it comes to the media ownership, there are, there are no recorded uh, media outlets that are uh, owned by the China or the, uh, or the Chinese outlets in Serbia. But um, as mentioned, uh, there are uh, Chinese programming that have been translated in the Serbian language and uh, broadcasted to the Serbian people, uh, most notably the radio station based in Belgrade that is uh, broadcasting the uh, Chinese, China Radio International. Uh, China Radio International also includes the Serbian new desk in, in, in Beijing, and there are connections between uh, Serbian media associations, study visits organized for the Serbian journalists who are going to China, uh, and from some conversation that I had, there is uh, maybe not uh, officially but unofficial uh, limit of how and uh, how can how can journalists um, that are part of the pro-governmental media can uh, can report about uh, China. But all, uh, and I will just mention this uh, because I, I would like to finish soon. Uh, the main promoter of the Chinese influence in Serbia are actually the Serbian pro-governmental media owned by the Serbian citizens uh, really close to the Serbian government, but uh, one above all is actually uh, the Serbian president and the Serbian government, basically Serbian ruling political elite. There is a certain level of consensus even between Serbian ruling elite and Serbian opposition, because we have seen zero to none uh, criticism coming from the opposition until recently. Um, and that is because of the two reasons. The first and foremost, most of the things that uh, have been done by the Chinese here in Serbia when it comes to the infrastructural development are actually uh, been the upgrade of the outdated infrastructure, preser preservation of the working places. So that is something that you cannot easily attack as the opposition leaders. But we have recently, um, uh, we have recently seen some of the direct consequences and challenges uh, that have um, came from the Chinese presence. And I will finish with just mentioning this. Uh, it is the political alignment of some, um, uh, some let's say, um, um, not, not that clear issues like no, no, not clear political alignment uh, with the issues like the Uyghur minority in Xinjiang province and Hong Kong minority, where Serbia openly supported uh, supported the Chinese efforts uh, in, in Hong Kong and in Xinjiang province. Uh, we have also seen that uh, Serbia is uh, openly supporting the one China policy, uh, like the China is supporting the, the, the fact that Serbia is not recognizing Kosovo as an independent state. But the most notable ones are the questions regarding the environmental protection and the impact that some of the Chinese companies had on the environment in cities where the major Chinese companies are present. I will just want to I just want to mention Smederevo steel mill, Zijin uh, mines owned by the Chinese Zijin and Zhenyanin tires, uh, the tire factory that is still under construction, which has recently been in the spotlight of the media because of the dreadful labor uh, labor conditions and living conditions. Uh, uh, for the Vietnamese workers that have been employed by those companies in the construction of those companies. Therefore, uh, we, uh, we see that the Chinese presence in the region is on the rise. We see that it has been most fruitful in, in, in Serbian case, but uh, it has to be highlighted that uh, it would not be probably as successful if we as a, as a society, as a country have clear vision of what we want to do next. In this case, we are just using the opportunity uh, to establish a uh, partnership with another uh, partner from the East. No question asked uh, what consequences can it bring to us in the, in the long term.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan. It's good that you you gave us a bit of an of an overview uh, on the Chinese uh, influence. What I do want to to do is actually refocus a bit on the disinformation side and the narratives because that's the main uh, focus of the of the conversation. And we want to understand what type of messages uh, are sticking, non-sticking, and who are sending them. And I think it, it's actually uh, very interesting that at the end of the day, when it at least in, in the Serbian case, is the the Serbian uh, pro-governmental media that does the most of the propaganda in, in Serbia. Um, I just want to ask uh, if by any chance you could cover um, if this phenomenon could be also seen in other countries in the Western Balkans, if you have, if you're aware of, not, not talking about the mine uh, uh, projects or any infrastructure projects, but uh, literally about the types of propaganda or narratives that are pushed out by other pro-governmental um, uh, media sources in other countries, or if you're not aware of any of that, uh, we have seen the evidences of the uh, of the presentation by the domestic uh, media in countries like Bosnia and Herzegovina as well. Most notably in, in 2020, both during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, when the media covered the donation, uh, something that has been called the donations uh, from from China when it comes to the protective equipment, but also it was the 25 year anniversary of the diplomatic relations between China and Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and it was a full blown uh, propaganda presentation in positive manner as a beneficial partner for Bosnia and Herzegovina. It was basically uh, a year long, uh, year long process. Uh, the situation in Montenegro is a little bit different because Montenegro has encountered the issue of the um, debt trap uh, connected to the highway project, uh, so significant influence to the, to the Montenegrin debt. But what we have seen was actually the counter propaganda stating that there is no such thing as a debt trap by the uh, both um, messages from the Chinese embassy, but also some of the media that at the time were connected um, to the former government, actually. Um, so basically what they, they have justified the project as economic development, uh, as economic development opportunity and unnecessary infrastructural projects, uh, not stating not stating the facts that it pushed the, the Montenegrin debt at that time over 100 100 percent in uh, North Macedonia and in Albania, it is not the case, and therefore we can make a conclusion that that kind of the pro-governmental propaganda comes actually in the countries where the political relations between capitals and the Beijing are on much higher level, while on the countries where we don't see that high level of cooperation, the propaganda is not uh, as usual as it is uh, in, in, in the country that I had mentioned beforehand. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, before I, I go back to Laura, I want to remind everyone that you have the Q&A function of the, the Zoom to, to raise your questions. We already have two uh, points there that I will pick up, uh, but uh, don't be shy. Uh, ask your, ask your uh, questions to, to, to our wonderful panelists. Uh, Laura, back to you on, on uh, two points. Uh, first is uh, this very interesting um, uh, conclusion, an early conclusion of what Stefan said that you, at least in the Balkans, you see no template on how Chinese dis uh, disinformation or uh, influencing through narratives is happening. Yeah? It's based on the local ground. Um, can we say the same that there is no blueprint uh, when it comes to the broader Black Sea region or comparing the broader Black Sea region with other regions where uh, Hamilton is tracking? That's your, the first point. And the second, uh, I did uh, want to follow up on, on the building um, information resilience or uh, community resilience to disinformation, um, going local. Um, how do we do that when we talk about such a diverse uh, language-wise uh, characteristics of, of communities um, and who should be in charge of that? <laughs> Those are good questions. Um, you know, on the on the first sort of how does Black Sea region compare to other regions? Well, I mean, you know, we look globally. So compared to sort of Chinese, if we're looking, we look at influence ops. So we can look at, we can talk about, you know, emerging tech or, you know, supporting economic development and whatnot. But if we look, at, and they are linked by the way, I mean, we can try to say to siphon out information operations and be like, oh, this is really separate from Confucius centers or BRI or investments in you know, critical infrastructure, but it's all of course very linked because Chinese information operations is, is 
more narrowly focused around those other activities, as opposed to getting into wedge issues about LGBTQ communities, which is like Russia's favorite thing to do. Um, so they are very much linked. But if you're looking at information operations, as far as what we can see from our sort of global view, it's not, you know, we're not seeing the levels of other parts of the world. I mean, you know, we've we've done some work now starting to look at different uh, parts of the global south, for example. And if you look at, you know, the information operations around uh, the, the sub-Saharan Africa, it's 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 quite extraordinary in, in the efforts that they're taking to get into local languages, to have teams of journalists. As I mentioned, they have, uh, Sunwa has more journalists than pretty much anyone in the continent. Um, I lived for 25 years in Southeast Asia. I can tell you very well uh, the effectiveness uh, living in Cambodia, for example, how the information, Chinese information connected to what they were doing with investments. And as I think one of the other speakers said, you know, investments that, you know, do not benefit the Cambodian people, do not employ Cambodian people and, you know, have environmental consequences. So the public opinion is slightly different. But anyway, so yes, so compared to Black Sea, and it's also different across different Black Sea countries, sort of dependent as what, as far as we can see on, on the level of engagement and trade and investment that they have in those countries. I mean, I'm most familiar with Georgia uh, in that regard, and we do see an increase in interests and investments, and there are Georgian groups that are tracking that. Now, on the second question about building sort of domestic democracy, um, obviously I wasn't suggesting a sort of cookie cutter approach here, but working with um, local democracy organizations, as well as, uh, you know, the important work that international democracy organizations play. Uh, you know, I worked for 20 plus years at the National Democratic Institute and the investments in these activities at the local level to build um, Basically, you have to get to what Soren was talking about, which is the, the model, right? So this is a governance model, you know, which is going to deliver equity and growth. And unfortunately, democracy is not having the best week <laughs> or month or year in that regard in proving that it can deliver. Uh, and that's, that's why we unfortunately see, that's one of the reasons we see backsliding all across the world is, uh, you know, democracy is not living up to its promise, political corruption, everyone's really despondent and angry. What are other alternatives? And, and that leaves a nice big vacuum for a Chinese narrative that comes in and says, hey, look at us. You know, we've pulled how many millions of people out of poverty? Uh, by the way, we're going to invest without any strings, which of course is nonsense because I've seen the strings and they're pretty horrid for countries um, but you know they're more hidden strengths it's not like oh you have to get better on human rights and election reform or we're going to pull aid they're different strengths uh, you know you're going to have to trade only with us you're going to have to vote with us in the un about this uh, this this issue oh by the way here's some surveillance equipment so you can clamp down on your political opposition so there are high costs but you know it is this enticing idea and 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 you know this is this is this is permeating everywhere i mean we're we're having conversations in the united states where we are we have elements of our far right here that are saying you know illiberal illiberal democracy like let's let's look at that angle or um you know so i think back to democracy investment so in order to make sure that people believe in that exercise is our i think our number one one of our number one priorities in combating this, this influence and building a more resistant citizenry to disinformation. So a citizenry that is more informed, more discerning, uh, not gonna go down those weird rabbit holes, has high trust in government, has high trust in media. Like, so if we don't get those pieces right, then I think we're more vulnerable. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm, I think investments in, there's tons of excellent democracy organizations in all the countries we're talking about. Like, let's support them. There's local media organizations in the countries we're talking about. Let's independent local media, let's support them. There's civil society, let's support them. Uh, thank you, Laura. I, I, I hope uh, that this message comes across, especially uh, to those political elites in, in the countries that we're talking about to understand the necessity of, of putting resilience or information resilience of citizens on a high priority. But just I'm Romanian myself. I live um, around the world in multiple countries. And uh, to be honest, uh, I've seen um, a very uh, few examples where politicians would uh, 
find this issue over other things related to development to, I don't know, pensions, um, economic uh, situation and so on. Um, so I'm just afraid that at the end of the day, uh, there's always a trade off and um, the, the idea of investing uh, into uh, building this type of resilience is not make, making the cuts necessarily. Um, so Reem, back to you, because I think that uh, you actually touched um, on, on, on having the ground on, on um, uh, in the Black Sea for, for this type of narratives or uh, all types of other instruments being used uh, to, to uh, turn uh, regular organizations or people into promoters of, of uh, Chinese messaging. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering how do we uh, contain the risk. I don't think that we can fix it. I don't think we can stop it. Um, maybe it's not even a good idea to, to have this as an end goal, but how do we contain uh, this risk on the medium and, and long term? How do we ensure that even though uh, people should get to understand um, China, just to know the risks at the end of the day, how do we make sure that that's not turning into an anti-Western, anti-EU, anti-NATO um, perspective on a long term? Uh, well, the, the easiest, the quickest question, uh, the quickest answer would be um, uh, we should be better informed about what is really going on in China and follow more, you know, the details of their uh, political, uh, you know, infighting and the changes, of course, taking place in Beijing. But this is, you know, very idealistic because uh, uh, how can I say the broader public should be better informed? I mean, with the media that we have, which is totally controlled by, by illiberal actors uh, at home uh, and uh, with a low level of information, with uh, eroding standards in education. So it would be an ideal to have a better informed public. Um, but uh, in the long term, this is what we need to do, actually, to fix our own weaknesses, because it's like a water mattress, you know. They are successful when we are weak, who is a European and uh, with the Atlantis project. Um, and I see this, uh, this question also about the other countries, Moldova, Ukraine. I think now uh, the, the point, the, 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 in, the flash of interest for the Chinese propaganda is obviously Ukraine because of the security situation there. And you see this, you know, respectful choreography the Chinese play with the Russians. They don't step on each other's toes, but they push in the same direction. And what are the narratives that you can see today on the Chinese blogs and uh, encouraged obviously by the state it's a european project is a failure uh, it it ends you in trouble like with ukraine uh, nato is an aggressive organization trying to occupy countries by nato you read americans because this is a and then you play into the hand of the anti-american discourse with a long history you know in the in the third world or in china uh, and the, the the ukraine today uh, you know is a is is, uh, is, uh, is an emergency for, uh, for Chinese propaganda. And it has a reverberation in other Soviet, uh, ex-Soviet countries where the Ruski Mir is present. And one of them is Moldova for obvious historical reasons because they are very permeable to Kremlin propaganda. They speak the language, you know. They have these internal actors who to push the illiberal discourse. Um, and although China doesn't have much interest, they, they didn't invest much in Moldova politically or economically. They were visible during the last year, uh, during the COVID diplomacy, because they, you know, they sent the boxes and they put the show in place with mayors, you know, and the mayors didn't even, didn't, didn't even know where China was. And they put the map of US, you know, on the box and thanking China. I mean, th these were, <laughs> they were uh, Borat kind episodes, you know, and uh, of China. Chinese propaganda because of lack of coordination and lack of knowledge, you know, <laughs> lack of resources. But uh, yes, this, uh, this, uh, these countries and societies and the political class is vulnerable uh, whenever the European and the Atlanticist uh, world uh, shows some signs of weaknesses. And there's more. Because of this crisis, we are now in Europe uh, speaking more the language of, you know, of dirigism of uh, economic dirigism, you know, new industrialism, uh, let's, you know, pick some winners, uh, do something, re-regulate because it ended us in trouble with this energy crisis. 
so if people hear more and more and more this language, some of them will conclude, well, why should we stop middle of the road? Let's go for the full package. Look how good, you know, the authoritarian development is. Uh, how nicely it works in China. So of course we should be more aware and speak more often about the causes of the problem, uh, about what is going on in Beijing, uh, what are the weaknesses of the Chinese development model. Uh, but in order to be able to do this, we need to fix our media environment. Uh, we need to take our own trolls and manipulators for out of the air. We need to fix our political class because at least here in Romania, in Moldova, in Bulgaria, and in Ukraine, they are the first who, you know, who create the environment which is permeable to manipulation. So it's, it's purely, everything that you list. It's purely domestic work. It's purely domestic work. And then who should do it? I mean, I, I'm going to press you on it because in the end, we need solutions. We, you said multiple times, and I, I keep on, on hearing people, we should, we should. But at the end of the day, question. there needs to be That's someone uh, who, ten years who is ago. in charge. 10 years ago, when we joined the European Union, we, the Visegrad counties and the Romania and Bulgaria, we thought the mission is over, democracy is consolidated, everybody packed and went back home and we didn't invest in civil society, we didn't invest in free media, we were absolutely careless. And now we see the result of that. We need to, uh, to start again the project of consolidating democracy. Uh, I, I'm sorry, this is, uh, you know, this is a very unappetizing proposal. It's not a quick fix, but without that, we'll be vulnerable to Chinese and Russian propaganda. So I think that uh, we need to go back to EU funds and USAID funds and other type of organizations because um, I don't know. Why USAID? What we are members of the European Union. I mean, there's plenty of money and there are very you know, good and uh, successful projects uh, with 10 million euro in Western Balkans. We just don't pay attention to them. And I don't think people in Brussels realize how important it is. Uh, or maybe they realize, but they don't, they don't have the right instruments because EU really has a problem uh, when it comes to soft power, to, to helping, to fixing media problems, uh, to helping civil society. EU was not created to deal with these problems, right? Of, of uh, unfinished modernization and uncompleted democracy. Uh, thank you, Sorin. I want to move to you, Stefan, because I think that uh, Serbia is also a very interesting case among the, the Balkan countries with support for the EU. It's just uh, the, the lowest uh, public support to join the EU, and that may be, uh, it's interesting how that perception is influenced by alternative narratives. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, if you were to advise uh, someone uh, responsible uh, decision maker in the EU or somewhere else, what type of me alternative messages or preemptive messaging should the um, pro, uh, Western European or the EU uh, send uh, or help uh, craft in, in Serbia, for example, what would those be? What would help counter the Chinese narratives at the moment in Serbia? Um, thank you for that question. And uh, look, I, I was thinking during Sorin's statements a little bit before, I'm not gonna bash EU. I'm not gonna bash EU when I, when I start talking. I'm gonna bash the EU a little bit. Uh, uh, look, if um, a country like Romania or B Bulgaria are feeling like that, that they are being left aside a little bit because they have basically reached whatever they they needed to reach ten years ago, you can imagine the feeling that countries that are not even in the part of the European Union have right now. And uh, there is an understanding which can be which can be said with a lot of certainty that. We would not have a successful Chinese entrance right now as we uh, uh, before 2016, and and with the fact that uh, basically the, uh, neither the enlargement process or the dedication from the Brussels to the region are on the same level like there were 10 years 10 years ago or, or even the, before Brexit, and it is hard really to give advice on, on what should be said and 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 um, uh, what messages should come from Brussels because. Uh, there is a, there is also the understanding that there is no unified stance within uh, 27. What is the stance towards the, the the European Union as well? So we have a conflicted message. On the one hand, there there are um, um, spokespersons from the European Parliament uh, being quite vocal about the challenges coming from the Chinese uh, presence in the region, even the propaganda that we are referring in these certain disinformation campaigns. 
But on the other hand, uh, we have a strong support for the cur current leadership uh, in the uh, in in Serbia, uh, which was which not was is the main proponent and the main promoter of the Chinese activities here. Uh, what we also, uh, as a community, as a, as a European international community, uh, have to understand is that we don't actually need China to uh, to backslide to the autocratic tendencies. We actually don't need China to limit the, the freedom of media. We were quite good in that 25, 30 years ago. So it is a question whether uh, that is the same path that we are now uh, moving for, forward into. What China is doing, uh, in uh, including the information space, uh, either the digital information space or a traditional media information sp space, is that China is really good in facilitating already existing trends. And if the trend was the democratic backslide, China will be a really good facilitator of it, but maybe it is not the one to be blamed. Maybe we should first and foremost look uh, within our uh, own back, back, backyard. I'm saying this because I have mentioned, and I will finish on this, the, the, the infrastructural projects, I have mentioned the investments. First and foremost, uh, both of those are not uh, the same. They are always presented by the Serbian domestic leaders as something that China gave us, but uh, we, it is not for the China's sake, it is for the sake of their own political power, centralization of power. And um, China today, and it is really funny to say, uh, is being used by the Serbian domestic political leaders uh, to position themselves, to, attend, to, to, to make their, their position in the place of power even more, more stable. So uh, for, it is quite beneficial and therefore, uh, processes like the like uh, disinformation campaigns or promotion of China are being pushed because it, they are useful and our government our political leaders are opportunistic thank you that's a that's a very interesting uh, con early conclusion as well on the on the twisting actually between the domestic narratives and piggybacking actually on, on China um, Laura I will uh, get this question on Turkey maybe to you from Samet Koban um, asking um, if there is, um, if you could talk about the Chinese propaganda in, in Turkey also as a, as a, a Black Sea region, um, given the um, part, Workers' Party affiliate press, Aydinilik, um, having a, a pro-Chinese uh, narrative in, in uh, Turkey. Um, is there a ground in Turkey for Chinese disinformation? Mm. Yeah, so I know that we are, have been tracking is this on the Hamilton, and I haven't, I didn't go digging into the data. I think the main, as I recall, the main messages are related to the Uyghur situation, as Turkey is a country that has spoken up um, quite vocally for the minority, and there are, I think, 50,000 Uyghur refugees in Turkey. Um, I recall that last year there were fears that China was using vaccine diplomacy to try to reach these refugees. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because to some extent, Turkey and China, for example, in the Western Balkans are competitors. Um, uh, but like China, the Turkish state media outlets are not as influential as influential still as Russian state media. Um, but I, I think the main messaging, if I recall correctly, and I can I shared the Hamilton dashboard for the participant to check out and, and do some searches, but it's really about the support for the Uyghurs. And, um, you know, the conflict that Turkey has there with regard to China yielding sort of immense economic influence over Turkey, um, yet at the same time standing up for the Uyghur population. Now, whether the, I think there was another part of the question about public opinion, and that I don't know. I haven't looked at sort of Turkish public opinion vis-a-vis -vis sort of Chinese um, presence in the country. But yeah, we should have some data on him, more precise data on Hamilton about that. Thanks, Laura. Maybe a bit of um, self-promotion. Um, a lot of information also on, on China and Turkey could be found in a report called China in the broader Black Sea region launched uh, last year uh, by Globsec with the support of the Black Sea uh, Trust of GMF, uh, which I am I proudly uh, coordinated and uh, edited. So uh, a lot of good information on China, Turkey there um, as well. Um, Sarin, I want to get back to you because there is a hot topic that we didn't touch upon, and that's the upcoming Winter Olympics um, in China. And uh, there is a lot in the media about the Chinese efforts to uh, contain the Olympic Village from, from uh, the, the rest of the country uh, to protect from COVID, the, the variants, uh, 
everything media around it. Um, how is that seen or do we see um, anything related to, to the Olympics in, in our local medias and um, how, what type of maybe uh, effect this will have long term uh, in terms of the, the 16 plus one relationship between China and, and the region if uh, the situation would explode, will explode during the Winter Olympics? COVID. This, is a, this is an instance where people, our publics in Romania and Bulgaria and everywhere around the Black Sea might become more realistic because we do have this coverage from the Olympics, which are about to start and they are translated and the, the, the media, the local media circulates these stories about the bubble, how strict the regime it is and how fake everything is there and, uh, you know, uh, what, what uh, bizarre atmosphere to have, you know, Olympic Games without spectators, without free media, with the internet completely blocked and controlled. So what's the point to have such? I mean, this is not Olympics in the old spirit. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, it's not a very big story in Romania and Bulgaria because we don't we are not very big on winter sports so we don't expect to 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 gain very much there's not much genuine coverage in the sports media I think we'll have a delegation Romania and never been discussed very uh, what, uh, who's going there and what I think we have about two, uh, two dozen uh, uh, athletes who go there and uh, a lot more officials as usual because they like to to to, to free ride on a vacation and I think the minister or sp of sports of Romania will go there, but I, I guess I'm not sure he will compete in Paralympics because he was a former sportsman who lost a leg and uh, well, that's okay. So the political representation is not very high from Romania. I'm sure it's the same situation from, from Bulgaria and comes into the, uh, you know, the uh, the story of this uh, disappointment about uh, 17, 16 plus one thing. So there's not much engagement in this. It's just among other, it's reported among other stories how, how bad it is and how controlled uh, the, the life of the athletes there is and how they cannot use their mobile phones. Uh, so in a way it is a start. So people, to, for the broader public to become more realistic and understand how things work in China. Uh, we should have had at the, on the, in Europe a more, uh, a more focused discussion uh, what is the point of having the, these big sports events other than, you know, uh, feed the pockets of the sponsors? Uh, why are we still, uh, why are we taking part after all, right? Why don't we organize something more, uh, uh, you know, uh, alternative events to have the athletes uh, engage? Because I think we'll have more and more of these uh, episodes in the, in the future because, uh, you know, the, the, the developed countries and the big cities of the, of the developed world are, uh, are cooling down to these big events who turn out to be more of a nuisance and not, much, and not bring so many uh, you know, economic advantages that people say. So we'll see more and more dictatorships or, 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 or you know, these uh, uh, fake uh, uh, places they build especially for such an event somewhere in the middle of the desert for, uh, for the big sport event. So, so, so you don't think that the Olympics will become an Olympic diplomacy moment uh, for, for China? I think it's difficult. It's difficult and I'm, as much as I follow the, the Beijing propaganda these days, they don't invest much, uh, much effort in it because they realize it's not selling well to the Western audience. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sorry, uh, Stefan. Back to you. Uh, if you want to touch on the on the issue of, of Olympics, if in any way uh, you could see in the Western Balkans um, any uh, interesting narratives pushed out about the uh, great efforts to to contain the virus or anything else, and I would like to also uh, go a bit back to what you said earlier um, and to ask you whether or not there is a difference in demographics in Serbia or in the Western Balkans when it comes to what type of narratives attract what uh, groups of citizens most? Uh, well, when it comes to the Winter Olympics, uh, most of the Western Balkans are terrible in the winter sports, so it's not quite big uh, as the summer ones, but uh, uh, I, have, I have tried to find uh, some kind of statements coming from Serbian officials 
there has still none of those. Uh, we don't know whether we will have delegation, but I honestly don't know whether we have any athletes competing in the Olympic Games. So uh, that that is that is something that cannot be described as the important discussion topic right now in, in the region. When Not Croatia, to, though. Croatia is big on winter. Well, if if you are from Croatia and that you call Croatia Western Balkans, someone will get oh, mad okay, on okay. you. So, <laughs> okay, okay. so it's with the Croatia start start be, uh, being part of the Western Balkans when they be, uh, when they become part of the European Union. Um, when it comes to the uh, look, uh, there is a high level of alignment between uh, pe population that supports ruling government, current ruling government, and that supports China. Um, and even if in, in the areas, um, in the regions, in the areas that uh, China has been seen as a harmful actor, um, that, the, the, that is not the dominant narrative. The people who are criticizing uh, and uh, raising uh, concerns about some of the Chinese, um, um, Chinese impacts to the environment, for example, have been in minority. Uh, be, why? Because that narrative of harmful effect has been successfully pushed out by the mass media uh, that can be called pro-governmental. Pro um, the independent media uh, uh, now um, reach is now limited in Serbia. It is it is uh, um, it is basically a couple of internet portals and couple of cable uh, cable news uh, news stations. That, that you where you can hear some of those concerns and some of those objective criticism pointed towards the Chinese, but uh, through the pro-governmental media, the dominant narrative of the overall Chinese positive impact to the Serbian economy has been uh, has been pushed. When it comes to the age groups, um, we don't have that high level of influence when it comes to the Chinese culture. We don't have that high level of influence when it comes to the promotion of the Chinese products besides Huawei which is uh, the biggest uh, telecommunication pr pr producer of the on the infrastructure of the devices of the devices in Serbia uh, but when it comes to the when it, what we can see uh, we, we there is a possibility that we will see a shift in that because uh, the chinese cultural center is about to be opened in in Serbia uh, it is a gigantic building in the same spot where the Chinese embassy was destroyed in the NATO intervention in 1999 in Belgrade. So it has also that historical and symbolical significance to the partnership between Serbia and China, but it will also become probably the center of the Chinese culture. And therefore we can say the, the, the center of the uh, Chinese promotion as well, uh, which will be uh, which will include the Chinese language lessons, cultural programs, sport events, even promotion of the sport events. Uh, because right now the popularity comes through the popularity of the of the ruling class, of the ruling elites, uh, and um, uh, it, it depends. It depends basically on that fully. Um, they have not pointed uh, their uh, campaigns towards certain age groups. They are doing catch all because their their main promoter, a ruling elite, is doing that exact same thing. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Laura, I have a question um, maybe related to the US administration or the US decision makers and how they do they look at the Western Balkans, Black Sea region when it comes to, to Chinese uh, disinformation efforts. Um, we know about the uh, Clean Network Initiative and uh, the Summit of Democracies and everything else, but I'm just wondering if there is something that you could feel from, from the Hill or from, from the administration that um, there is a renewed focus, or how, how is that perceived in, in DC? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think there is a focus in general uh, on uh, the sort of information integrity more broadly. Uh, I mean, as it applies to China, as it applies to Russia, as it applies to domestic uh, uh, information operations. Um, and there has been a big, you know, focus with regard to foreign aid, for example, in supporting efforts abroad to sort of bolster defenses. Uh, the Summit for Democracy, I actually just was on a meeting for the Summit for Democracy, and that actually came up as, as in the commitments. We're doing an analysis of the 100 countries' commitments. Um, and, you know, the information space came up and foreign interference in general came up as a, as a, as a common concern and therefore a commitment to do something about. I didn't, I didn't analyze it by region yet, but uh, you will be making some analysis uh, public of those commitments. 
so I do think there is an interest. There is increased funding for activities to support efforts to, um, you know, for public diplomacy efforts that I was talking about in NATO, for example. I, you know, worked very closely with uh, the NATO mission when I was in Tbilisi. Also, the U.S. Embassy supported efforts, as well as the British Embassy, for that matter, on, you know, supporting public opinion polling that we did or working on strategic communications with the government or working on this issue of, of you know, getting out ahead of some of these narratives. So that was, that's interesting. I also think that um, what, what, what I think is happening less is that, you know, we've looked at it as this problem over there and obviously our own country is being um, torn apart uh, by uh, disinformation, mal and misinformation. In the US, I would say less so from, I mean, China is definitely very present here, particularly on the COVID issue. Russia is, is extremely involved in our very most sensitive wedge issues uh, from trans girls in sports to LGBTQ rights to, you know, education and school boards, everything. Um, and I think that, you know, we haven't focused as much on sort of what do we do about that here. But yeah, I mean, I, I do think that it's on the agenda. I think there's also a broader concern beyond the information issue about Chinese um, interference uh, operations more broadly, as I discussed before. And I've been in many conversations recently where, um, you know, there's an interest particularly in, in the damage that might be happening in the global South. That's coming up a lot. And focusing again, as I mentioned, on Africa, but also on um, uh, Central and South America. So, yeah, I mean, in short, yes, this is on the agenda. Maybe not like the top thing being discussed today, but certainly the information environment. What do we do about it? How can we build resilience? And how do we, um, you know, what do we do about the influence that China is having beyond just in information space, but on domestic politics, on trade agreements, and on our sort of geopolitical alignments and 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 relationships and alliances. I mean, I think that there is an awareness there. And we'll see, you know, the White House's uh, strategy, China's strategy is, you know, coming out. So we'll see what is is involved in that. But I do think there is an awareness. Thank you. Uh, sorry, maybe the same question. Um, is there awareness in Bucharest and Sofia? I'm talking about the two, um, given the, the current reinforcement of the NATO Eastern flank, uh, the extra deployment of troops, everything else. Is the current uh, moment and reinforcements, uh, reinforcement of the NATO Eastern flank um, used uh, in, in by Chinese propaganda or it's not actually seized as an opportunity so far. Um, and again, uh, is someone in Brussels or so in, in Bucharest or Sofia aware of what type of long-term or impact could that have uh, in case of a, of a real conflict uh, over Ukraine? Uh, China is definitely using it. Uh, we see it uh, mostly in the English language using their state media propaganda, but also in uh, 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 you know, uh, people, uh, private influencers who are, you know, in a shade of gray uh, 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 area. We don't know uh, who actually belongs to the state propaganda and who is more distant, but also influenced. Um, so, uh, yes, I think opinion leaders do know that this is a, a territory where there is competition. Um, one way to fight back, to come back to one of your previous questions, is for us to start to speak more about the other China, the Republic of China, the China which is truly democratic, and that's Taiwan. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are countries in Eastern Europe where Taiwanese investments are bigger than the Chinese investments. Well, we don't speak about these issues. Uh, so, look, we have an example uh, of democratic development, which is, by the way, much more prosperous, although they started in the same position with the People's Republic of China. So if you want to be convincing, you should also show the positive example. Uh, this is one way to go. And uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think uh, many, many states in Eastern Europe are shy. They don't want to uh, to follow up in the Lithuanians, uh, you know, uh, steps because uh, there are dangers. 
Uh, but this is a game to play, actually. Uh, again, what is going on now in Ukraine must be, you must stand your ground uh, in, 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 in what you do in politics, in diplomacy, in economy, but also in rhetoric, you know. You must stand for your values, you must speak up the truth, you must, you know, show who really needs security guarantees, and that country is not Russia, it's basically Ukraine, and in this way you fight also Chinese propaganda, because they are very much involved this is a very good moment for them uh, to project influence and to show, you know, their big battle, rhetorical battle with Washington, but also increasingly with Europe, uh, who is blocking their projects, especially the, the EU institutions, um, uh, and will be here in the middle, and we must make a choice, and we must speak more clearly to our publics and to our population and show them and, you know, inform them uh, and this is our role, you know, people who speak in public uh, to, to show also the good model, which is Taiwan, uh, and uh, show the prosperous society there, which is also Chinese. Uh, and we should stop speaking about China and equivalent China with the uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, with headquarters in Beijing. Uh, before I give you, uh, I'll make the last uh, round for wrap up remarks. Uh, we do have a question uh, from an anonymous attendee, actually. Uh, we actually have two, meanwhile. Um, one of them is related to Montenegro, uh, whether or not the citizens of Montenegro are aware of the significant debt due to Chinese loan, and that's, uh, I'll address it to um, Stefan. And then um, we do have here, I did not read it in advance, I read it as um, now. Hi everyone, what an interesting debate. Thank you all for the data and information and insights. You said something about the Chinese propaganda promoting their successful economic and social model, decreasing poverty and so on. What do you think about the growing middle class in China earning a lot of money, owning big apartments, buying luxury products and expensive cars, living comfortable uh, lives, so on and so forth, as they claim comparing to other countries, how the Western countries can fight this kind of propaganda or social blindness? Um, and maybe this will be uh, the last question that you could um, insert into your uh, wrap up remarks, uh, where I would like to kindly ask you to, if you were to advise, uh, I don't know, someone in the White House, someone in Brussels, um, someone in your own government, uh, in your home countries, uh, what to do immediately to ensure that the long-term risks are contained, um, that would be great. So Stefan, maybe we start with the Montenegro question and then uh, we'll go around in the order that we start, um, starting with Laura. Uh, well, to wrap it up quickly, uh, Montenegrin contract has been signed in 2014 and the debt issue has arisen in 2020 to 2021. So um, in, it was not solely infected by the fact that the interest rates and the overall price and the longevity of the project, there have been many other economic and financial issues when it comes to Montenegro. But um, I would not say that the majority of the Montenegro, not being from Montenegro, give me the limited understanding of the overall sentiment. But from the, my perspective, I would not say that the wider public in Montenegro is aware that debt is Chinese. Uh, they, they are probably aware that there is a debt because it, uh, it, the story was heavily politicized uh, by the new government that have even reached out to the European Union and received prompt and SWIFT know when they plead for the help in the repayment of the debt toward the Chinese, which actually, actually Chinese used to uh, reestablish the cooperation with the Ministry of Finance in Montenegro and uh, even announce some of the new cooperation project. Therefore, uh, I would say that uh, I would say that uh, um, they they are expecting they are expecting the highway to be beneficial, but also they are expecting uh, for, for the, the government to find a solution to the debt crisis, which they ap apparently did, but uh, it was not so in the broader public to the sentiment. I would not say that it was connected to the Chinese. I would say that it was connected to the previous government that uh, signed the contract with the Chinese. Thank you, Stefan. Laura, for wrap up remarks, back to you. Thanks, and I'll try to incorporate that last question, which is really interesting. And it comes back to, I think, the points that both CERN and Stefan were making about, um, you know, messaging. And um, one of the things I think we've learned in the information space is that, you know, post-factum um, 
corrections are important. I mean, we need to do fact checks, but it's a little bit of a whack-a-mole. So I, we need to also focus on those preemptive messages. And I think those preemptive messages can be offensive and defensive. So on this issue that the question, uh, the question that just came up, you know, okay, what do we do? wealth um, and, you know, pulling millions of people out of poverty. Uh, but, you know, what about images related to people getting, having their building literally shut down um, during COVID and being unable to exit uh, <laughs> their house without even being able to go to the grocery store because they purchased Advil or something. Um, so the liberties focus, and, and I just would like to give an example that was, uh, I like, I like data and research. So one of the uh, research projects we did in, in Georgia, but it was related to Russia, is we, we tested preemptive messaging about Russia. Uh, truthful, nothing untrue. But so, for example, we knew that they were peddling in a lot of disinformation related to quality of life and religiosity. So we said, you know, do you know that the average life expectancy of a Russian is 70 and a European Union citizen is 78? And then we said, you know, did you know that church attendance in Russia is 5% and, you know, 45% in the United States? Did you know that domestic violence, I mean, just these kind of things. And we saw that it actually did move the needle because we did control and treatment groups and we found it did move the needle in perception. So those are sort of the defensive preemptive messaging, like sort of cutting down the sort of great success of, 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 of Chinese existence uh, or PRC, I should say. Um, and then the offensive strategy, which is what I talked about before, which is getting out ahead with your own national narrative. And I, I think this is something that countries have done, some countries have done quite well. And also coming up with that coordinated sort of whole of society approach. You know, how do you get, you know, your, like the Finns have done and Sweden has actually just announced a new um, interesting uh, strategy for, you know, how does the education sector, the defense sector, the civil service, like how do they all work together to uh, coordinate efforts and, and classify disinformation, mal and misinformation as a security issue, as a, a whole of, a, that requires a whole of society approach to resolve, whether that's civic education from, you know, age five up, media literacy, whatever, but, um, you know, having that sort of, this is the supply side, what can we do from the top down? And then I, you know, I don't want to repeat myself, but I also really believe that we need to address the demand. And, you know, as I say, in the United States, I mean, we can change algorithms of social media platforms, that would be actually fantastic. We could regulate, you know, certain channels, but as I think Soren said, it's like, I'm using it slightly differently, but it's like sitting on a waterbed. You can close this channel, it's gonna come out here. So what do we do about us? Like we, the people, the ones who are like the big lie or like whatever it is, like we're the problem. We're the ones who are consuming it. So how do we build our inoculation? And then I go back to those tricky long-term investments in um, communities and in building citizen resilience. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Laura. Serene? One to two minutes for the wrap up remarks. Yes, I cannot but, uh, you know, uh, uh, agree with what Laura said. And if this is a problem in, uh, in, in the US and in Western Europe, you can imagine how even bigger of a problem is in, in these countries in Eastern Europe, uh, who are relatively new to the space of, uh, you know, freedom of opinion and uh, uh still you know with this fledging democracy institutions and with this appeal you know uh, where they see that uh, you know the new dirigism works and uh, uh, somewhere uh, in a very distant place there's a country called the people republic of china and they managed to do this bright thing in just 20 years uh, you know this myth has really a, a power of attraction uh, we need to start to, to, to take very seriously these stories because in a way I find these more threatening than the uh, uh, than Kremlin's aggression online, you know. Uh, we have an experience, we have a history with Russia here in the region, we know what to expect from them in a way, and uh, although they are, uh, they are feared, they are not credible as an alternative model of society, but China might become, it is not yet there, but it might become if we are not careful, you know, to debunk this myth and to show 
you know, the ups, which are real, indeed, they pulled out of poverty uh, tens of millions, right? But this is normal in a society coming out of the awful 70s of the Mao, total social and economic disaster is normal to have fast growth for a number of years, and then it levels off, and then they start to have problems, you know, of balance, and uh, everything is very normal. We need to learn of all, all, all these things and get out of these, uh, you know, fantasy stories. Thank you, Sorin. And uh, one to two minutes for you, Stefan, as we are running out of time. Um, as focused on a solution uh, as possible. Um, all of the processes and all of the developments that we were focusing on tonight, tonight uh, will continue to mirror the levels and the nature of the societies and the government in the Western Balkans region. Uh, to put it like this, if the country is pro-EU and if country feels that there is a clear future of the European integration, clear benefits from dedication to that process, then the success of all of the processes that we have mentioned can uh, be uh, put under, let's say, control or uh, can, can be mitigated. Therefore, uh, the region needs a clear European future. It needs clear and defined steps ahead. It needs uh, additional, uh, additional work on the overall uh, awareness about certain issues, uh, awareness of the disinformation campaigns at all, not only from one or uh, this or that actor. Um, we cannot do this by ourselves. Uh, we, uh, we are already receiving and sh should continue to receive support in uh, successful implementation of those processes. And we should, uh, we should be uh, aware and, sh and, and, and uh, we, can, we should be assured that without that, uh, we, ha we have a tendency uh, to backslide to some of the um, levels of democracy that cannot really be seen as uh, <laughs> colorful in the sense that uh, we would like to see them. Uh, and with this, uh, I would like to officially wrap it up, uh, thanking you all for these wonderful contributions. I hope that our audience also gained interesting insights uh, from the Black Sea, extended Black Sea region and, and the Western Balkans. Uh, if there is one thing uh, that really uh, sticks to my head is uh, this uh, power of attractiveness. And I think it's down to each one of us in our respective roles to try to change that power of attractiveness to, to ensure that the risk uh, short, medium and long term is, is contained. Um, thank you, GMF, for inviting me to, uh, to moderate the conversation. Uh, maybe I hand the, it back to you, Veronica, to give the information about the, the next series uh, or the next webinar in this series. Um, again, thank you all very much and have a wonderful afternoon or uh, evening, depending where you are, Veronica. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura, Stefan, and uh, Serene for these wonderful inputs. I thank you very much, audience, for all being so engaging. Uh, there has been questions about Western Europe, so this is going to be exactly the topic of our next conversation, so we'll be able actually to analyze what is being done in Western Europe in terms of, of dealing with Chinese disinformation and uh, um, one thing I also would like her to stress is that, of course, now we all are overwhelmed what is happening in uh, between Ukraine and Russia, and we all have been looking into Kremlin disinformation, but let's not overlook and let's not undermine what is happening, what is coming from Beijing. It's, it's equally important, and uh, with this, uh, I am wishing you as well a very happy afternoon or a very happy evening. And we're really looking forward to seeing you in a few months. So stay tuned and uh, GMF will definitely let you know about the next webinar on Chinese information in Western Europe. And I've also shared with you our research done by East Center. It's about the resilience to disinformation coming from Kremlin and Beijing with featuring also Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, and Armenia, and Azerbaijan, among other countries. So if you're interested, also feel free to see. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Alex, for incredible moderation. It was, it was fantastic. Thank you. Bye.